We're going to go ahead and get started. It's minute afternoon, so I um, want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, my name is Stacey Grolnick. I'm a member of the Cancer Center Education Work Group. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining the presentation today. Um, when you've joined the meeting, you'll notice that your audio is muted. Uh, we just ask you to keep it muted during the presentation, and we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, and you can then unmute your audio if you have to ask questions. Um, we also encourage you to use the chat feature to pose any questions during the presentation. And we'll try to get to as many of those um, questions as possible in the Q&A session. Um, in the chat, you'll see there's a link to sign in for the session. Please take a moment to complete the sign in. This is really helpful to our work group um, to measure attendance um, at our virtual sessions. And it also um, gives us the distribution list to send anonymous surveys following presentations. So that's really helpful as well. Um, so I'd like to move on to introduce our speakers for today's presentation. Nicole Gleason and Becca Keenitz are from the Be Fit, Be Well program. And the Be Fit, Be Well program is a three month long individualized exercise program for individuals diagnosed with cancer. Um, who are currently going through the treatment at the University of Colorado Cancer Center or that are no more than six months from treatment. So Nicole and Becca are both members of that um, project team. Nicole's an exercise physiologist um, and the program manager for the Be Fit, Be Well Cancer Exercise Program at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Nicole received her Bachelor of Science degree in Health and Exercise Science from Colorado State University in 2006. She's got 14 years of experience working in the industry from managing high-end government fitness sites in DC metro area to overseeing clinical patients in a hospital setting for cardiac and pulmonary rehab programs, as well as working with outpatient physical therapy. Nicole joined the CU Anschutz Health and Wellness Center in early 2012 and has been an integral, integral part of um, getting the Be Fit, Be Well exercise program up and off the ground since its inception and has been deeply involved in the development of the day-to-day -day operations and growth of the program since its launch in August of 2013. Becca is an exercise physiologist and a program coordinator for the Be, Fet, Be Well exercise program. Becca received her Bachelor of Science degree in Health and Extra Science in 2014 from Colorado State University. Upon graduation, Becca went to the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center to complete a 600-hour internship with the BFET Be Well Exercise Program. Becca has been at the Institute's Health and Wellness Center working for the university since graduation in 2014. So I'm excited to turn this over to both Becca and Nicole to give us a lot more information about the BFET Be Well Exercise Program. So I'll turn it over to you guys and thanks for presenting. Great. Thank you, Stacy. Well, we're excited to be here and thank you all for taking time out of your day to um, hear about a program that we are very passionate about and excited to share with you. So um, I will share my screen with you all here. Just a moment. All right. See here. You all see it. There we go. Yeah. We can see um, it. So can you see it okay? Um, okay, yes. so, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so our program is Be Fit, Be Well. Um, we are at the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center working with um, the University of Colorado Cancer Center also, um, and we are a strength-based exercise program. Um, for those of you who have not been to our facility, here are a few pictures of our um, facility on campus, which we miss being in dearly, but um, uh, just, awesome pictures of our track and our pool and we're just it's a beautiful facility and we're really lucky to um, be housed there and also it's kind of a little bit of an escape for patients to come there and um, just be in this awesome facility so if you haven't had a chance yet definitely um, check it out if you if you can um, so our vision is um, obviously, to transform the lives of cancer survivors um, by providing expert evaluation. So in that meaning, we, love, we do um, assessments at the beginning and end, and we'll get into the details of that. But obviously, that goes into allowing our program to be really individualized for patients, um, obviously, including excellent patient care meaning talking to all of the providers that they're also working with, their physical therapists and whatnot, um, so that we can kind of 
be in that loop so they don't feel like they're having to fill us in on everything, but we're providing that um, awesome patient care that is known at the hospital. Um, and then uh, we obviously focus on cancer specific exercise. So we're a strength based program and that is what we are um, focusing on. We are doing research and will continue to. So we, um, our vision is to be research leaders in Colorado, working with the University of Colorado Cancer Center and the UC Health System. Um, Nicole, can I jump in real quick? I, I'm not seeing your slides at the okay. end. Let's see. Apologize for interrupting. No, that's okay. Let me see if I can get it. If not, let me know, Becca. I can share mine on. Yeah, let me try one more time. Can you see it now? I think you have to enable editing on the um, the file, and then you should be able to share. It'll advance after you do that. Nicole, can you do it on yours? Yep. I don't know why it's not. Sorry. Get you caught up here. That's perfect. perfect. Thank you, guys. Now, okay, now we can see you. It. Okay, perfect. Um, so, a quick overview of what the research says. Um, it's really exciting to see that the research does show that there are benefits of exercising during and after treatment. Um, obviously, not just for physical function, which is a lot of what we focus on, but also the side effects that we can't always see, like fatigue, anxiety, um, depression, those social interactions that are hindered during treatment um, and overall quality of life, which we obviously know is a huge part of um, dealing with cancer treatment. And so the research is backing that this, there is um, benefit to exercise during those times as well as many other benefits um, and just exercise in general. So there's um, specifically, the, obviously a lot of the research is around breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate, they're the most commonly studied right now. Um, but there's specifically with breast cancer and reoccurrence from breast cancer, there was a study that showed 40, per, 40 to 50% of a lower risk of breast cancer reoccurrence, um, which is obviously huge. And so the research is still, that's why we love to be a part of it because there needs to be more and it is increasing and it is at the forefront of a lot of um, people's minds as far as research, but um, we're just, the research is there, but we're, there needs to be more essentially. Um, but cool links to see between cancer and exercise. This chart is one of my favorites, the benefits of exercise during treatment. Obviously on the, in the black column here, you can see a lot of the side effects and this doesn't even touch on all the side effects that patients experience, but um, the rapid weight loss, the cachexia, the um, cardiovascular disruptions and disturbances, obviously all the psychological and the emotional um, social stress that patients deal with through treatment, um, as well as decreased muscle strength and muscle endurance often seen with um, being sedentary during treatment time and rapid weight loss or weight gain. Um, and those things can often feel out of control for our patients. And so that's why we love that the blue column over here um, kind of point for point shows you that the benefits of exercise can go head to head with the um, side effects that they're experiencing with treatment. So we don't just focus on weight loss. We obviously focus a lot on increasing muscle mass. So if people are losing weight rapidly, sometimes they're cautious about doing an exercise program, but we can obviously work on um, increasing muscle mass and putting some weight on. There's obviously increased muscular strength and endurance benefits, um, as well as, again, the psychological and social um, and emotional stressors that they see. So it's kind of an empowering slide for our patients to see that this is something, exercise is something they can control. And when they can't really control the side effects, they can control a little bit of how they can combat those um, different side effects that they're experiencing during treatment. Um, why do we have a program? The big reason is these numbers right here. Um, only 25% of adults meet the requirements, um, the recommended requirements by ACSM. Very similar, um, the general population and cancer survivors are told to get 30 minutes three times a week of moderate cardiovascular and then also two to three times a week of strength training, so resistance training. And 
general population, only 25% are meeting those recommendations. So imagine then getting added a cancer diagnosis um, or not feeling well and whatnot. And so we know that that can be a really hard recommendation to meet. And so um, that is why part of the big reason why we have our program is because we can be there alongside them because some people don't even know the recommendations at all. So they don't even know that they're not meeting them. Um, so part of it is an education piece, but then also a support piece. Um, and then obviously it's sort of through 51% of adults are sedentary. So not even getting the movement that you need throughout the day, whether it's because they're sitting at their job all day um, at a desk or whatnot, but these numbers show that there has to be um, something specific to help cancer survivors get the recommendation that they need. Um, I think one of the big things too on that side, saying ACSM talks about, if nothing else, try and limit survivors should try and minimize the days of inactivity. So if nothing else in the day, if they're just being told to just minimize days of inactivity, that can just be a starting point um, before they get into actual exercise. So um, that's a great recommendation. So kind of the difference between those two, getting, staying um, active, get it, minimizing days of inactivity, but then also exercise, there is a difference. And often this is something that is very confusing to our patients. And so we do try and educate on this. Um, and so just to make it simple, exercise is obviously intentional plan. You're going to the gym or working out in your basement um, on a specific body part that day or whatnot. Um, but you, it's intentional. You're doing reps, you're trying to increase in weight. And it's planned and structured. So you know what you're doing, you have your stuff planned out ahead of time um, versus physical activity, which is more like what we do in our daily lives, which is also extremely important. But that's more things like just running around with your kids. It's more spontaneous, cleaning the house, different things that for sure get your heart rate up a little bit, um, get your body moving. So important to stay functional and active in your daily life, but it is different than exercise. So some of our patients will come and say, well, I'm active with my kids or I have an active job, but they're not doing any sort of weight training or structured training. And so that's something that is important to add in um, just to build lean tissue and different things like that. So um, that's a huge difference to know. Um, so bring, that brings us to why we created the program. It was started in spring of 2013. Um, by Dr. Tom Purcell, who many of you I'm sure know. Um, he came to the um, Anschutz Health and Wellness Center with this idea um, rooted from his deep passion of exercising and um, taking care of cancer patients. And so the program was born in 2013. And so we created a specific aim um, and it's obviously to our goal is to provide evidence-based, individualized. I think that's our big um, point here is we our program focuses on individualizing every program for the patient because we know not every patient is the same um, and supervised exercise prescription um, for cancer patients so to improve their functional capacity their quality of life all those different things that um, the side effects and treatment can certainly affect and we our hypothesis so that patients would show interest and um, in an exercise program, and that has shown true. We've seen over 700 patients to date, um, and we've had 45 interns from 10 different universities, which has been really cool to educate the next um, group of students and just to see their passion and to see that there is so much opportunity in this field, even though it is somewhat new. Um, so just to see that in the last couple of years of how many patients, and we're just scratching the surface with how many we can see, but um, that's been really cool over the years to see all those patients and interns come through our program. Um, we get a lot of questions about the specific details of our program, a lot from providers, just because they're unsure of who qualifies for the program, who does it make sense for a patient to come be referred to us. Um, so our program is a three month program, like it was mentioned before. Um, something about that though, is that we do see patients that are maybe out of town, from out of town, and they're getting six weeks of radiation and chemo at the same time, and they're staying here for six weeks, and we will certainly take those patients during that time just to try and get them a jump start, um, but typically, it is a three-month-long program. The assessment's a really important piece. We're um, assessing, obviously, different physical function, um, movement patterns, 
just to kind of see where everyone is starting. Often someone on the phone will tell you something different because they are talking about what they used to do or what they did before cancer treatment or 10 years ago, how they ran marathons. But to see them in an actual assessment is extremely helpful to um, tailor exactly to what they need. And then we're also assessing with surveys um, fatigue, depression, quality of life, sleep, all those different things that do go into making it um, individualized for them because those do affect their exercise programs. Um, they're seeing us twice a week. So they're getting essentially 24 to 26 um, sessions on one-on-one -on -one for that first month. So they're getting personal training sessions, an hour-long personal training session um, for that whole first month. It's just them. Month two and month three, they go into a group session. Um, these can be with up to three other people. These are really important because not everyone is doing the same thing. It's not like group fitness where everyone's doing the same thing at the same time. They're doing their own workout that was written for them for that day, but they're in a group um, setting. So we've seen some really cool friendships and support systems and um, accountability come out of those groups. And it's just a really great time for them to encourage each other and get to know other people who are going through something similar. Um, they have access to the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center, just like a regular member would. They can come to classes that we can help them kind of decipher which um, group exercise classes might be appropriate. Um, but all the things that the Wellness Center offers, they have access to as well as a pool class. We have a warm water therapy pool. Um, so they do, we teach pool classes twice a week specific to our patients. And so they can come to any of those things that we offer. So it's a great experience for them. Um, the cost of the program, again, another thing that we get a lot of questions about are, it's a monthly cost of $59. Um, total is 177 for the three months. It's important to know that it isn't monthly because often our patients will take a month and then they need to freeze for um, surgery or something unexpected. Um, Health-wise comes up and so it is nice for them to be able to freeze their membership and then they can continue with us later on. So that month to month makes it nice for them um, or they can obviously pay all up front. But this cost is basically what an off-peak member would get would pay without any personal training sessions. So um, they are getting a really great value in that um, and that everything's included, their assessments, their training sessions, all the classes, everything like that. Um, something that we don't necessarily advertise but we do have is a subsidized rate. Um, we do offer this if someone is unable to join the program, if they have to choose between buying their groceries or joining our program. We never want that to be an option, and we've seen that in the past. So we created a subsidized rate for participants, but it is on a, just a case-by-case -case basis. So that is available if patients are um, unable to pay the full amount of the program. Um, who qualifies? Another one that we get a lot of questions about. So. Um, they have to be patients, a current patient at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Um, so we'll take any of those patients um, and undergoing treatment or no more than six months post-treatment. So any treatment, chemo, um, hormone therapy, radiation, surgery, any of that will qualify. Um, and we like to also let it be known that we see any patient. So if they are We've had 20-year-old collegiate athletes coming in. We've had, we have a 95-year-old who has been just doing amazing in the program. So they don't have to be at a specific fitness level necessarily to join our program. We've had amputees, those in wheelchairs, um, and everything in between. So um, we always say it's better just to refer them over to us, even if you're unsure if they would necessarily be appropriate for our program, um, because we can kind of talk that through with them based on um, where they're starting at functional wise um, and who can refer. So all of you can refer. So you can, um, oncologists are our big one. Um, obviously, Dr. Purcell there, he's a big champion of our program. Um, and you can refer through EPIC. On our next slide, we'll show you how you can do that. But um, also any radiologist, any of the supportive care team, so physical therapists, massage therapists, anyone, their surgeons, um, you can tell a friend, however they can refer, and they can self-refer. So our flyers are up throughout the can cancer center, um, or often you can have a flyer and just give them our contact information um, because they can call in. They don't have to have a referral. We get their physician clearance and everything later on, but um, they can refer any way they would like.
through EPIC, um, it's pretty simple, but we do, you can just refer to the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center, and then there is a Be Fit, Be Well tab underneath, or you can just list in Be Fit, Be Well. Um, again, if you don't know if they qualify, it's better to just send them our way, because then we can say, oh, no, you're five years out, we have a, we know of another program for that, or um, you're out of the state now, we can find, help find you a program, um, for sure, to help them find their next steps. Um, these are different ways also too. we have, they can apply online or they can just call us um, or email us and we're happy to respond in any of those ways or fax over. Um, so that slide is a helpful one to save if you're referring patients over. Um, I'm going to take over from here. Um, just to dive into a little bit more about what we're looking at when patients come in. Um, Becca touched on it briefly about the initial assessment that we do. Um, we're also doing a post assessment and this really helps us identify maybe where someone is starting to then best build a, a quality, effective and appropriate exercise program for us. Um, like Becca said, we're seeing patients that are as young as 19, as old as 90 and everything in between. Many have used a gym or a fitness facility in the past some have never been on a treadmill or on a piece of workout equipment in their life. Um, so we really wanna get an idea of where this person is starting. And we do that by um, doing an initial assessment. And this just really gives us a really in-depth dive into where this person is both, both physically, mentally, um, by looking at some of these metrics. So when they come in for their initial assessment, usually this is done um, prior to when they start the program. So Becca mentioned the program is three months in length. Um, typically the initial assessment is done in the month prior to which they would start with us. So they come in, um, the assessment takes about an hour, hour and 15 at most. Um, we have them wear workout clothes, um, thing, something that they're comfortable to move in because we do get them up and moving. Um, prior to coming in, they're filling out all of their initial paperwork with us, which does include a physician clearance form. So this is something that they need signed by their oncologist, radiologist, the nurse practitioner that's referring them. Um, really, we think of this not only as a, a safety metric for them, um, but also a, a liability piece for us. So if there's anything the surgeon or the physician um, wants us to be cautious of or be aware of, they can write that on the physician clearance form. Um, so they're coming in with all that paperwork, and then we're taking them through this, this movement piece, if you will, um, looking at height, weight, blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen levels, um, and then we move into some, some physical metrics, um, looking at flexibility of both upper and lower body. Perhaps they had a surgery um, that might affect range of motion in their shoulders or lower body, um, maybe an abdominal surgery where they, that might affect their core strength. So we are assessing muscular strength um, with a grip strength. We do a sit to stand test, as well as have, we have some functional physical functional tests in our assessment, um, doing a tug, a timed up and go. We do a single leg balance test, a stair climb test. Um, again, really just, just get an in-depth view of where this person is starting physically, even if it's completely different than where they were six months ago. Um, as well as looking at some of those psychological um, components, as Becca mentioned, um, we assess these via online surveys. So we use the FACT-G for the functional assessment, um, the FACET to look at fatigue, the GODIN to look at aerobic strength, um, kind of where they're at right now. And then again, we're reassessing that at, at their post-assessment as well as at three months, six month intervals after the program to kind of get an idea if this is something that people were able to maintain after starting a clinical exercise program. Um, and then depression as well with the CESD. We also have an internally developed wellness report, which is looking at, it's sort of a holistic approach to wellness, looking at confidence, occupational wellness, um, sleep, financial wellness, et cetera. So all of that is in that hour and a half, hour and 15 minute appointment with us, um, as well as setting some goals at this time, maybe things that they have in mind to help them get back on their feet. Maybe it's getting back to work, or maybe it's, um, just having more stamina throughout the day so they don't have to take a nap at 2 p.m., things like that. So often people are asking, what do our training sessions look like? Um, Becca touched on this. All of our training sessions, we tell people to a lot about an hour. They're 50 minutes in length. Um, 
month one, every training session with an individual is all one-on-one. -on -one. So this is one cancer exercise specialist per patient. Um, we do this for a number of reasons. It helps establish the relationship between trainer and, and participant in the program, as well as to really assess movement patterns. Um, we're able to identify sort of movements that are we give the green light on where we can progress and also movements that need work, things that um, maybe they need help with, getting on and off the floor, um, core strength, if that was affected by a surgery, things like that. Um, if it's appropriate, month two and month three, individuals are moved into a semi-private training session. So this is one or one cancer exercise specialist per four, up to four um, cancer patients going through our program. Not all patients go into a semi-private session. Um, we have had some in the past that we just deem aren't appropriate for that setting, um, but most do. And so, like Becca said, this has been instrumental for us. Um, some of the, the side effects that we've seen with the group sessions have really helped build autonomy. Um, friendships have developed out of this, and those were sort of... Um, unforeseen side effects that have been incredibly beneficial and and things that have been reported back to us that patients really enjoyed that that social network um, at the end of the three months we are doing a reassessment um, and we also look at a strength we do a strength test with individuals at the beginning and at the end using a one repetition max um, to, and completing those online surveys as well so when we, when we talk about exercise, um, Becca touched on the difference between physical activity and exercise. Um, but then when we break down exercise, we know that there is strength training, there's aerobic, anaerobic training, as well as high intensity interval training. And what's appropriate for one patient is going to be completely different and appropriate for another patient. So we are trying to, based off of the initial assessment, really develop a highly effective and individualized plan for the participant based on not only their cancer type, their diagnosis, where they're at with treatment, their past history with exercise, um, but also how, how receptive they are to getting into the gym and trying out new things. Um, we have a, a structure or a skeleton, if you will, of the types of exercise that we're doing. And then the exercises that are filled into that skeleton are going to be different for every patient. Um, for example, if we have an individual on a hormone-based therapy, um, Lupron, for example, if they're um, gaining weight with that, um, maybe experiencing um, you know, a high BMI because of that, we might incorporate some metabolic exercises for that individual, as well as really focus on strength for their programming, um, because we know that can help offset some of those side effects that they may be experiencing, versus someone on the flip side who might be a pancreatic cancer individual, um, and maybe they're cachetic, and they're losing mass amounts of weight in a really short period of time. We certainly don't want to induce more weight loss for those individuals. So we might cut out the metabolic component in their programming. Um, but every training session looks very similar. Um, the exercises are going to be different based on the individual and where they're starting. Um, we do a warm up and often patients are coming in, getting this warm up done on their own, maybe walking around the track, getting on an exercise bike to get a few minutes, getting their heart rate up. Um, we then, when we meet with them, we're moving right into a mobility and stability exercise, or we call it movement prep, doing dynamic stretches. Um, and this is really just to help get the body warmed and primed for those movements we're gonna do later on. Um, we focus a lot on building core strength. Um, we're really cautious to maintain neutral spine for 98% of every participant that comes through our program, just because we know that many individuals, while also having a cancer diagnosis, are also experiencing some orthopedic issues, perhaps low back pain. Um, maybe they had a total knee replacement years ago, things like that. So it's really important for us to make sure that we're building on the core foundation and kind of working on those transverse abdominal muscle groups maintaining a neutral spine, and then building on some of the reciprocal patterns using opposite arm, opposite leg movement patterns. Um, every training program has a strength base to it. Um, we, we think of that kind of like our meat and potatoes, if you will, of the program. Um, Becca highlighted it and, and mentioned it, that we are a strength-based program, and this is um, something that we believe 
many of our participants benefit from building muscle mass while going through the program. Um, so we do this in a number of ways. Body weight exercise is, is obviously one of the ways we start, and this is, tends to be the safest way just before putting a lot of weight in someone's hand. Um, we do bilateral movements, so unloaded and loaded using right arm, then left arm, left leg, right leg, um, things like that as well as working through different planes of motion, horizontal plane, vertical plane. And we try to focus on a total body program every single time we see these participants. So if they're coming in to see us twice a week, we're doing total body workouts with them two times a week. We're meeting those minimum guidelines that ACSM has set for cancer survivors, as well as general population, that they're getting a minimum of two days of strength training. Um, balance is something we see a lot of um, disparities in balance. Maybe someone is experiencing neuropathy and balance becomes an issue, going up and down stairs, stepping off of a curb outside. So balance exercises are incorporated into almost every participant's program. Um, I briefly mentioned metabolic exercise, but short definition of metabolic is that we're sort of maximizing effort in a really short period of time, and this can really affect caloric burn. Um, and so this can be a great exercise for individuals that are gaining weight with exercise or just want to lose weight in general to incorporate some of these metabolic exercises into their program. Um, and then obviously flexibility, things that will make sure that we're focusing on toward the end of their training session with us. So just to touch a little bit on the exercise science component, um, our training philosophy for everyone coming through the program is really to get them into a state of hypertrophy. So what that looks like from a training standpoint is roughly two to four sets, eight to 12 repetitions. Um, the whole idea behind muscle hypertrophy is to increase muscle size, um, which is different than um, increasing muscular strength. Um, build muscle stamina, which we know these are things that are lost during, um, as one ages, as well as during cancer treatment. Um, and studies have shown this, this can definitely improve not only their function, but improve quality of life as someone can move better and get on and off the floor, lift their grandchildren. Um, they're often experiencing a higher quality of life. Our training principles. So we've identified five training principles that we feel are most important when putting together an exercise prescription for cancer participants um, through our program. And the first, we've touched on this again, is individualization. We need to make sure that these are, every program is appropriately individualized for the patient's needs, which is why we're not, we don't have a blanket approach. We don't have a, a standard strength training program for every participant. Um, just given the vast differences that we see in patients coming through, both with age, experience with exercise, um, past injuries, all of those things we have to take in consideration. Um, the second most important thing that we take in consideration is the specific differences that we see um, per cancer type. So whether it's a hormonal cancer, if they're prone to neuropathy, if they've had a surgery, if they have metastases anywhere, particularly bone or ones that we're concerned with. Um, so making sure that their training program only adds to the way that improves the way that they're feeling, knowing the treatment plan that they're on and perhaps the side effects that they might be experiencing. Um, Progressive overload, this is probably seen with any exercise prescription, whether you're in a cancer exercise program or not. Um, and really this just means change in stimulus over time. So for us, this is often done by increasing volume, number of reps, or increasing weight. And so we try to make sure as we're looking at a 12 week program for a participant that we're hitting time points where we're seeing progressive overload um, so that when we do get to the end of the three months, we are seeing change in that post-assessment with their muscular strength and muscular endurance um, tests. Recovery time, we encourage all of our participants to set up their training sessions as such so they have a day or two of rest in between. Um, this is really important, especially when out external stressors are fatiguing the body, um, particularly their chemotherapy, um, perhaps their mental state, they're stressed, worried, things like that. Um, making sure that their muscles have adequate time to recover is, is really important. So we stress individuals scheduling with us um, in such a way that allows for this. Um, 
And then variation. This is obviously necessary so we can avoid boredom with exercise, um, but also necessary so that we can see continued improvements. We talked a little bit about unilateral exercise um, and variation often helps us identify weaknesses in individuals that have a difference from right to left side, whether it's due to the cancer or perhaps just a dominant arm versus a non-dominant arm. We often see that in individuals. Um, safety, I think um, this is something that I want to stress the importance of. Um, every individual on our team is has a cancer exercise special certification in addition to a degree in the field um, as well as a number of other certifications that we hold um, but we really talk about this with our participants that they need to listen to their body um, and we ask them a ton of questions every single time they're coming into the set into the center to train um, we want to know how it's feeling our goal is to get them on this rpe scale which is the rate of perceived exertion somewhere in the yellow zone. So we want the exercises to be challenging, kind of a five, six, or seven, but not into that orange or red zone. So nothing that's really hard, really, really hard or maximal effort. Um, we know that by pushing them, that's when we're gonna see change in muscle size and muscle strength over time. Um, but we also need them to be able to recover and not have multiple days of soreness. There needs to be that fine balance. So listening to their body is really important and letting us know things that they're feeling. Um, we talk a lot about quality over quantity. So quality reps over quantity. So if they can only get five push-ups on their knees and that's it, then that's where they stop. We don't need to get to that 10 or 12 rep range. Um, we talk a lot about where they should feel the exercise. So when we educate them on an upper push ex exercise, for example, this would be the front of the body kind of moving weight away from the body. Um, they shouldn't be feeling that in low back. And if they are, that's when we want them to stop, reassess, and we're educating them while they're coming in for their individualized training sessions. But more importantly, after the three months, we want them to know and understand where they should and shouldn't be feeling these exercises so that they can continue this exercise program sort of long term. Um, when to stop and when to consult with their fish physician. This is a big one. Um, if there are things like unexplained breathlessness um, while seated, you know, maybe they didn't just climb a flight of stairs, things like that that come up or pain in a specific area after a week or two of rest, um, we want them to be talking with their physician just to make sure that we're ruling out everything um, in terms of what might be going on with their bodies. Um, and then we talk a lot about the difference between injury pain, injuries and pain versus muscle soreness and how those can feel different. Um, considerations that we look for, um, anemia can be a contraindication to exercise. We do have individuals that are slightly anemic that are involved in our program, um, but this can cause lightheadedness. So things that we need to be aware of when they're going from a supine to a seated or standing position, um, or even just engaging in an exercise program in general. Um, metastases, particularly those that have um, metastasized to a bone. Um, it's important to note that we don't wanna put undue pressure on those metastases, but we can safely work around the metastases. So the physician clearance form is incredibly crucial for us to have and often oncologists or their surgeons are making note of these so that we're we can better prepare the exercise prescription for them and then those that are on immunosuppressant medications um, often those individuals we don't want to be doing high intensity interval training um, there's been studies that show individuals athletes in an athlete population individuals that are engaging in high intensity interval training have a dip below baseline in their immune system and so the thought would be the same with a cancer population that we don't want those individuals dipping below baseline for um, those that are on immunosuppressant medications so here's our team um, as becca mentioned dr tom purcell was kind of our our brainchild behind this program and and is incredibly passionate about using exercise as a tool and informing patients that this is part of their treatment. So they will go do their chemotherapy, their radiation and exercise. And we hear that often from not only his patients, but many other um, oncologists that are referring patients will say, my oncologist has told me that I need to do this as part of my treatment plan. Um, 
Dr. John Peters works with us at the Wellness Center and he really helps us more from a developmental program development side um, and has a background more in research. Um, Ryan Marker is a, a PhD as well as has or as a PT as well as has his PhD in rehab medicine um, and joined our team recently full-time as a, an assistant professor and is really helping us get going with the research side again um, because we know that's a crucial part for long-term existence of the program um, as well as identifying um, areas that we need improve, to improve on. And then um, myself, I'm the program manager, Becca Keenitz, who spoke earlier, our program coordinator, um, Ian is our lead exercise physiologist, and Jared Scorsoni is our database manager, um, really working closely with Ryan Marker on the, the research and database side. So a small team. We also bring on, I should note, we bring on student interns every semester um, from local universities and universities nationwide, and these students are graduating from a health and exercise or like program, exercise physiology, kinesiology, and they're often required to do an internship of anywhere from four to 600 hours. Um, so it's a great way for us to educate them on what we're doing in the cancer exercise world. Um, and as Becca mentioned, we've had over 45 interns join our team um, over the last five years. And, and those interns have gone on to then either work in a similar field or um, gone on to do physical therapy, nursing, et cetera. So it's, it's a great way for us to kind of be teachers in the industry and um, help them learn this specific clinical population. So just a few slides on clinical results and then we'll kind of wrap this up for question and answer. Um, this is from about our first 100 participants in the program. So obviously we've had close to 700 now, so this is just a snapshot. Um, but this is looking at, um, not only do we see improvements in strength and stamina, which are big, those are the physical improvements that we would expect to see as an exercise physiologist, um, but we're also seeing significant changes in both fatigue and depression. So you can kind of see from the facet on the left and the CESD on the right, um, the facet, there's a, a drastic change from an initial to a post assessment, which indicates um, less fatigue, as well as the CESD, um, a decline in the score indicates improvement in depression. Um, so huge results for us to see that even if a person doesn't have physical changes, we often see some of these um, not so seen or psychological changes that are happening within the program. And then looking at muscular strength, this is done by that one repetition max that we're doing both at the initial and the post. Um, so leg press is a machine that you get on and put your feet on and we're assessing how much they can do safely in an estimated one repetition max. And so you can see that from initial to post, there's a pretty drastic gain in, in pounds being able to lift. And then sit to stand. This is a great functional measure. Um, how many times an individual can sit to stand out of a chair in 30 seconds. Um, so this relates to a lot of daily life activities. And, and again, we see, we've seen improvements um, in the program. So just a little snapshot. The, the big color wheel on the right is just indicative of all of the different cancer types that are represented that we're seeing on a annual basis. Um, as of December 31st, 2019, we've had 665 participants enroll in the program. Um, the age range of these participants, as we mentioned, nine, 19 to 90, our average age is right around 57. On average, we've seen an increase in strength by about 35%, which we're pretty proud of, and that's all due to their commitment to the program and their consistency. Um, and then when we break down by gender, we typically see about 34% men, 66% female. Um, and as I mentioned on the previous slides, we are seeing changes in those psychological measures as well. Um, so kind of life after quarantine, what are we doing now? Um, we obviously have been working remotely and we just recently got approval to start seeing patients back in, in the center. Um, the center is doing a number of things to take precautions to ensure safety and that they have time slots that patients can sign up for. Um, there are marked out spots in the gym for individuals to work out, um, as well as wearing a mask, things like that. Cleaning is happening both before and after a training session. So 
they're doing a really great job to ensure safety. Um, we, we are doing a lot of stuff virtual, and this has kind of prompted us to think about a virtual platform maybe sooner than we ever thought, um, but we know that there are patients that may not be ready to come into the center and or aren't um, recommended to come in by their physician. So we have some virtual stuff that will be happening. Um, we're using an app to train participants as well as setting up um, virtual memberships and doing Zoom training sessions so that we can sit kind of just like this in person with a participant to do their exercise routine in their the comfort of their own home. Um, Dr. Purcell has graciously offered to review all patients that are wanting to join and kind of exclude those that he feels might be too immunocompromised to join. Um, and we do want to make note, this is still the patient's to choice to come back into the center with us. Um, and we'll let them know all those safety precautions that we're taking, um, but that we do have a virtual offering. And so even if you're thinking um, your patient might not be appropriate to go back to a gym setting, you might still think about referring them to the program because we can adapt a program in a virtual setting for them. Um, kind of life now. Um, this was a study that we did probably three years ago now. Um, Dr. Ryan Marker um, looked at pancreatic cancer patients going through neoadjuvant therapy. They enrolled in a 16-week exercise program intervention with us, two to three days a week, 60-minute sessions. Um, the big thing I'll point out with this, these are individuals that are known to be cachetic or are cachetic at baseline. Um, and as you can see from the little graph on the right, um, the three participants that we had in this study um, collectively um, pre op your baseline to pre-operation had an improvement in their muscular strength, which previously had been thought that that's really hard to do while they're going through chemotherapy, they're losing um, weight, but the fact that we were able to still put on muscle mass before these individuals um, went through their, their surgery was really a benefit um, that we, we saw. We do have some current and upcoming research studies. Um, just so you guys know, if, if you feel like a patient might be appropriate for one of these research studies, again, we can kind of help discern and get them involved in these. Um, so not that you guys have to know about that, but we are doing a research study um, with Sarah Purcell. She works at the Wellness Center with us, um, and her study is on exercise and appetite in breast cancer survivors. Um, and then we have an upcoming one that will be for rural cancer survivors experiencing fatigue. So this will be all virtual and um, Ryan Marker will be um, ho hosting this study. So if you're interested in a few of those that might make sense for your participants or patients, um, definitely reach out. Um, let me peek at our time here. I think I might skip the video. I'll send these slides out so you guys can see. This was a nine news story that was recently done, um, gosh, back in April about um, our participants and life in quarantine and virtual offerings. And so we thought it might be fun to share, but I wanna make sure we have time for Q and A. Here is our contact info, um, Be Fit, Be Well program line. We still have access to, even though we're working remotely. Um, and like I said, we'll be back in, in office hopefully next week. So I'm gonna stop my share here and kind of turn it over for question and answer. There are some in the chat, Nicole. Okay. I can... Awesome, thank you for, um, for that was super informative. I, I knew about the program, um, but didn't actually know much about it. So this has been great. Um, if audience attendees want to unmute their line, they can certainly ask questions or, you know, it's a little bit easier if you put them in the chat and then we can moderate through that. And I think Amanda is going to help moderate the chat too. Yes. Thank you, Nicole and Rebecca. Um, so we have a couple of questions right now. One of them is what is the retention rate for the study? Um, that's a great question. Um, for our study specifically, um, so we, we run a clinical program and that's what every participant that is referred is just enrolled in our clinical program. We also have a registry going, which is um, one of the studies that we're doing. So patients that are referred, um, we ask if they also want to join our registry so that we can collect that data. Um, so in terms of the clinical program, the retention rate, um, 
I apologize, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but um, when we were looking before, go ahead, Becca. It's 70% um, complete the pre and post assessments um, and about 75% go to um, 12 or more, complete 12 or more of the sessions. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great, so, yeah. thank you. Um, another question was, with enrollments going back to 2013, is the study considering looking at long-term impact following completion of the program? Yes, and actually that's something that we recently started. Um, last year we um, amended our registry database to be able to reach out to participants at a three month, six month, and 12 month interval to assess their, their physical fitness at those different time points. Um, to help us better understand long-term impact of adherence to an exercise program. Um, we also recently had a student from CSU completing her master's degree do a study with our program. Um, she implemented six additional um, classroom type sessions with participants um, to address barriers to exercise, things like that. And her hope was that those six classroom sessions would then increase adherence to exercise long-term. Um, and she's finishing up the results of those, but um, really positive results that she saw just from the preliminary data that was coming back. Um, so things that we wanna do to kind of help improve the program long-term is implementing some of those things that she saw um, to help really help individuals adhere to this long-term. Um, and we know one thing that we've always talked about is having sort of a, a next step or the, the what's next program once someone graduates the three months. We, we certainly know three months isn't long enough. Um, if we could keep individuals for six months, a year indefinitely, I think we would, all, all of us would. Um, but feasibly, in order for us to enroll new, we just don't have the bandwidth to keep all of those. But we know that this is an area where we want to really work on kind of creating a, a next steps or a graduate program to help individuals maintain an exercise program for a long term. Great, thank you. Um, we also have another question from Deb McAllister. She asked, do you incorporate diet and weight evaluation in your program? Do you, go ahead, Nicole. I don't want to cut you off. No, go, go ahead. ahead. We do um, the weight evaluation. Yes, we are obviously weighing them, them at the beginning um, during their assessment to get their BMI. Um, but the big one that we do measure is their body fat composition, um, just because we know that that's a better um, tell of what we need to work on if um, lean tissue and all those different things. And that's kind of an encouraging one for people to see sometimes at the end, they won't see the scale move, but to see that their body fat percent has changed so that they've gained muscle is a really, really cool thing to see, especially in three months. Um, that's a pretty quick time frame to see a body fat percent change. So um, that one is kind of more what we lean on, but we do also talk to them a lot about if their weight has changed over time, because often, like we said, they're experiencing a lot of weight changes. So we will, um, some people ask us to weigh them throughout the program just to keep an um, idea of what their weight's at to make sure that they're still maintaining weight. Um, and then as far as the diet, we do try and talk to them a little bit about, we stay in our scope of just talking about what they eat before and after they exercise. Sometimes people are coming in and they're getting dizzy and they can't figure out why. So we'll kind of talk to them about if they ate something before, or um, kind of pairing a little bit of a healthy protein and carb once they're done to help build um, lean tissue. But otherwise we do refer out, um, Lisa Wingrove is um, in house with us. And obviously she used to work at the cancer center and she's just an incredible resource for our patients. So she does cooking classes and um, like a cancer specific one um, and then, or disease specific. And they can also do a consult with a dietitian at the cancer center. So um, we kind of resource those out to those. Awesome, thank you so much. Does anyone else have any other questions? I just had a quick comment. I'm a 13 year cancer survivor and I wish there had been something like this when I was getting treated 13 years ago. This is very cool. 
Thank you. That's awesome. I love that you guys have this kind of program. And now I get to steer people to UC Health and to the Anschutz campus because, oh my gosh, they have this program. It's so awesome. So it's great that you guys are doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on being 13 years out. <laughs> All right. Well, just a reminder um, to please make sure that you sign in before you leave as we will be sending out a survey afterwards um, on this presentation. Thank you so much, Nicole and Rebecca, for um, presenting this program with us. And we'll make sure to send out the slides and the recording of this uh, to everyone um, in the next couple of days. Awesome. Thank you. Thank so you much. for having us. Of course. Hope everyone has a great rest of their day. You too. Thank you. Thank you.